not win. No surprise, right? <laughs> okay, so first of all, I want to make sure I understand something. Um, have estites ever been put in any section of river in the city before? We have structures like this in this, they have not been connected. So, uh, a structure exactly like this, have, no, we haven't. And so the reason these specific shaped dikes are being put in is because some of your stakeholders requested them, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, I know none of the stakeholders in this room requested s dikes, so I'm assuming it's some of the ecological groups, is that who you're referring to? Yes. Okay. What throws me off there is the National Wildlife Federation actually brought a civil suit trying to stop them from putting more dikes in, whether they're s dikes or green dikes forward. So what is the environmental groups that have asked you to put these in? Say about the, the National Wildlife Federation lawsuit against us? No, I'm saying I don't listen to the National Wildlife Federation that is saying this is uh, helpful to the environment. Oh, what you organizations, know, what, what stakeholders do we work with yes. to create you know, structures like this to enhance the environment and maintain ecological diversity. We, we work closely with IDNR, Illinois Department of Natural Resources. We also work closely with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as the Missouri Department of Conservation. So those are the three main um, uh, stakeholders, environmental stakeholders that we work with. So they're the ones that requested the sites? Yes. Well, they're the ones that requested us to come up with a unique structure that we haven't constructed before. So that led to the yeah that led to the S dike design. Okay. So yeah, they were looking something for something that once again that would create. Can I go back? So the whole the whole purpose of the X dikes are to you know maintain nav navigation depths, act like actual river training structures, typical dikes, but to allow flow on the back side, as well as removing these two structures here or shorting them. The whole purpose was to get flow in the center of the channel, and these, these why these end sites work really well, is to get flow on the back side to create that secondary channel for habitat. Um, and we've used chevrons many of times. We probably have over 25 chevrons within the St. Louis district. And our proposal was to use similar structures like that to chevrons. But once again, it was, it was requested uh, by our external stakeholders to come up with a unique structure to create unique habitat within this range. That's what, that's what led us to these test dikes. Okay, so what you're saying is, I'm looking, I, I know this is not a, the exact number, but I know there's at least 260 river navigation structures in just Jackson County alone, which I think is still in Jackson County. It may have been just south of Union County line, but it's close, because Union County has 170. So wing dikes and chevrons, the only reason you didn't use one of those is because of what this does, what you think this does for the environment. Is that correct? Well, it, yeah, it maintains, like, we could have used traditional structures, and it saves us money as well, because if we would have constructed a river train structure off the bank to that same length, it would have required a lot more rock to construct that type of structure versus this S dike that's off the bank. But once again, the whole purpose was we don't want to. We want to allow flow on the back side of this to create that secondary chute or channel to allow flow on the back side of that. That's why they're not typical dikes connected all the way to the bank. So this green is not land. The aerial photo is actually land. So maybe that's causing some confusion. This is, this is actually a river. It's just a contour elevation. This, that's actually water. So flow is actually coming through here right now. If there's flow through here, so this is the bank, this is the other bank. Flow, we want to make sure that we, we maintain flow on the back side of the structures for an environmental benefit. Yes. So more water will be pushed towards the Illinois side? More water, well, yeah, there'll be, they'll, 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 there will be a flow split. So if you compare it to a traditional, yes, if you compare it to a traditional dike, series of dikes, yes, more flow will be pushed, pushed towards the Illinois bank. And you guys don't think that the levee Well, I think the, the, the elevation of the water is independent of that, the river train structure. Whether more flow is on this side, and some flows on this side, or less flows on this side, and an equal amount of flows on that side, that's not going to really change the water surface elevation. It's going to be uniform. It's going to distribute evenly through there. 
So if this is deeper, that may actually have a benefit to the levee system because the water surface elevation may be a little bit lower. And by the time the water is, is high enough to even touch the foot of, of the levee, these are submerged by gas by 15 feet or more. So you're going to have, like you see, I believe right now, you're going to have water dispersed all the way through the river. So it's not as if these are just pushing, pushing flow at all of the stages towards the Illinois Bank. Yeah, I'm sorry, I should have clarified that. Mostly at lower river stages. So you're going to have a secondary channel. Like Eddie said, at, at, at higher river stages, these, these structures are going to be overtopped anyway. So it's independent. So when the water is higher, like that bank flow, wouldn't that mean the water passes over these river structures because of friction, that the water would actually slow down as they pass over these the more structures that are in there? But it depends on the water surface elevation. Right at that point where uh, you know it's, it's just about to overtop, there may be a slight impact. But when you look at higher stages, there's no impact. And this is exactly the hypothesis that was tested in the model. So when we did the ADH model, it's a two-dimensional model. So it evaluated both the potential roughness of the structures, but also the increased conveyance in the channel and the increased conveyance along, along the bank line. So that was the reason why we had chosen. Zach can, or Don can correct me if I misspeak, but a lot of the reason why we the reason why we chose the two-dimensional model is to make sure we accounted for that when in the say, roughness element. When you say two-dimensional model, are you meaning like like a sandbox or what are we talking about? Or like a computer model? This is a computer model. Okay. We have committed the last the last meeting to do a multi-dimensional uh I don't know, a computer model, which is what which y'all requested. That's what we did. And that's really the kind of standard I'm looking at a problem like. Um, my last question now is, when you say 0 0.05, I read on the study online, uh, there was a little bit of a rise, you said in certain spots, 0 0.05 feet. What I didn't understand, is that for the whole project? Is that for s type? What was that 0 0.05 feet for? What that was, this is very, very small, does not propagate upstream or downstream or over to the banks. So you have a little bit of influence right near the structures, but it is not significant influence upstream or downstream or across the bank. So was it 0 0.05 for every structure? No, it's just, just these red areas. So it's not necessarily all around the structure. You can just see these small little red blips. So each red area is Are there other little red spots up and down the river besides just this spot here? I think a lot of this, I don't want to get overly technical, but a lot of this is, has to do with the merging right around the structure. So basically we use two different data sources for the structure elevations and then the bed. So I think a lot of that has to do just with how it merged right around the structures at the moment. So you, I don't even know if we would, I don't think you would expect to see that in the field at all. I think that's just what the model shows to the elevation change. To further address what I, what I think your question is, is I believe what you're asking is, okay, if you have greater than 0 0.05 for each structure, and you have three structures, that means it's 0.15 by the time we get to the top. And the way that this, that this shows is, so this is the water surface difference from the pre and the post. So what we'd be looking at in that case is what does it look like when we get up to the top end of the of the, uh, the project site. And you can see that everything above where all the structures are, there's zero increase in water surface there. And what Zach is saying is what, what you see over the structures is a very local area that doesn't propagate to the banks along the banks. There's no influence, no influence, no influence, just this one little area right at the top of the, the structure itself that doesn't propagate so so you're not getting a cumulative impact. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm with one of the uh, drainage districts here, uh, here uh, nearby. Uh, one of the things I've learned working with the Corps is the uh, when we do a project, say a pipe through the or something, 
the core is going to real quick tell me that we can undersize some of our pie chips are smooth as opposed to corrugated. Our old pipes are corrugated, didn't they? And you guys can real quick tell us that corrugated pipes slow the water down, create turbulence, friction, and everything else. Um, so we reline with smaller pipes and we're assured that it'll carry a lot more water than smooth pipes. And your studies are saying that all these little ribs in the river have no effect when it's when it's underwater, you know, when we're at flood height. Are you saying there's no friction, there's no turbulence? No, there there is friction, but what what I think Eddie pointed out was there's actually a change in the river bed. So that river bed's getting deeper. So that accounts for the friction we're adding to the system. I mean, if it was a, if it was a rigid... Part, part of it's getting Yeah. Yeah. So that's the whole purpose of putting the river train structures in there, is to deepen the bed. So for your example, it's a rigid structure. So you're, 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 when you go to uh, a corrugated metal pipe to uh, uh, a plastic lined PVC type pipe, you have less friction. So your area, actually your area decreases, but your energy increases. And that's kind of what we're doing to the navigation channel. Our area is getting smaller, but it's more efficient. So you also kind of alluded to the fact that cost was cost was a uh, factor in going to these types of structures. Sure. Uh, I mean, if, why can't they uh, keep dredging and pass the cost on to these hundreds of millions of tons to go go up and down the river? Well, once again, that's that's the benefit of the nav. That's why people use navigation number one. Is it's so cheap. If we were to call, if if, if Nat River Navigation were to pick, uh, pay for dredging, the, the unit price per ton of cargo to transport that would be would increase. Yeah, right. It would increase the uh, big numbers. Yes. Yeah. Over. Yeah. We save our transporters over three billion dollars a year. And well, the Department of Transportation raising licenses in order to build roads. I personally would like to see something like that <clears throat> that would maintain the channel rather than trying to you know, force it over or whatever. I'd like to see something else look at. Something else besides you know, the dredging? The dredging. I think the dredging is good. I know it's expensive, but uh, you know, you're know you going for the least cost approach and you know, it's not always good for it. It seems that we have our priorities. And just, just to put a little perspective on the dredging, the cost, uh, this is apples and oranges, but just to give you an idea, down in New Orleans, to, to dredge the Mississippi River down there, it's about $90 million a year uh, towards the mouth of the river to keep that channel open. But that's the uh, Exactly. I'm just trying to give you one. You, you, you said you know it's expensive. I'm just trying to give you an example of how expensive it can be. Yes, sir. It seems that our priorities are wrong. We're going to change the river and we're going to divert it two ways here for wildlife. Wildlife lives in the wild. I mean, what, what about all the people that's up and down the side of this levee? We're working hard every day to keep it there. And we, we totally understand that. That's why we spent two years developing this model to ensure what we're doing is not going to impact flood heights. I don't think you, that's, you're, you're understanding that. We, I, we, I don't we understand would, that. How come we, we don't do. have an outside group come in? If you are the experts and you know you're right, right, bring somebody in, let them come up here, and then, then you prove them wrong too. I think we've already gone through why we're, we're not doing that. Um, you know, we're the leading experts in the field. If anyone wants to look at our data, we'll share it with anyone that wants to look, look at our data. All of our work's been peer reviewed. But we you have don't want to compare yours against theirs? We don't even have their data. We've been asking for their data for 10 years now, and we don't even have their data analyzed. So, I mean, we don't really have anything to do to compare our data to. So we've been very forthcoming, allowing the sharing of the information, but it's not reciprocal. We're not getting the information that other people are producing to actually evaluate. We would certainly evaluate it. We'd take that in consideration if we had a chance to evaluate it, but we haven't. That's why we're taking these necessary steps we're doing a numerical model. We spent two years. We put this pro project on delay for two years while we're continuing to rack up repetitive dredging costs at this location. We put this I project think just to ensure. We're coming from that we, we, you know, we feel like we ought to get a little second opinion too because 
you say we have to take your facts, and I mean, I could tell you that I have the facts too, but that doesn't mean I was right. I want to put it in a little bit of perspective. So when, when we build these structures, we're not talking about what we're really doing at this point of where we are in our regular labels project is we're making small changes to the channel. So we'll put a little bit of structure in with an additional contraction of 100 feet, 200 feet over a 1,500 foot channel. And we're essentially nudging the river to get a little bit increased velocity, get a little bit more depth. We're talking a change in depth of one or two feet. So these aren't, we're not making major changes to the river. We're not making major changes to where the river's flowing. These are, these are small little, really nudging the river to go where, where we'd like it to be. I just don't, I mean, I don't understand. If you were out here trying to run up the floor and I held my arm out there, it's just like a dike. I mean, it's, you're not going to run as fast as if my arm wasn't there. You're going to take off. It looks like to me that it's slowing, slowing the river down. Yeah, in your example, that would, that would be the case. But with a well, the river channel, down. that is a completely different physical. So when I go out here in the creek, my water is not draining because there's an obstruction in the creek. Yes. What's the difference? There's rock in the creek. Yeah, the difference here, if we go back to, to some of the previous slides. It really goes back to this. Is if you have a rock creek and you put something in the way, of course it's going to stop the water from moving and it's going to go up. The difference is when we build a structure, we're not putting, well, number one, we're not putting it all the way across the river. The rock in the creek's not all the way across the river. And number two, we've got a physical response of that river, which is the whole purpose of why we're putting structures in. Is so we, we add that additional constriction so we get the river to get deeper. That is, if the river didn't get deeper when we put structures in, we wouldn't be doing it because then we would still be dredging. So I think that's the, the big difference between the creek example or the example of if you throw a rock in a bucket or even the culvert example is that the purpose of these structures is to induce that additional scour and to make a more efficient channel for transporting, transporting water. So it becomes really a scale, a scale problem. I just want to clarify on some things maybe I didn't hear clearly, but I mean this is one of them. So you're going to put rock in to deepen the water. Yes. Okay. Does that not take area out for the water to flow? It does not. When we deepen the water, we maintain, we evaluate this. This is a concern that's been brought up many times. We've evaluated looking at historical data. We've evaluated this looking at pre and post construction scenarios. And I, to make sure we were weren't here all night, I took some of those slides out, I should have put them at the end. But we found that the area that the water is flowing remains roughly constant. So you're getting the same flow because of the bed changes that occur in the infrastructure. Now see, everything that I've learned is you put more in, you can put less in. So say we cut half this gym off. We want to build a garage. Well, the people that want to park their cars in the garage are going to tell you that you can fit 1,200 or 324 people in here, which is what this gym holds. Yep. But the people who want to play the gym and want to put people in here are going to tell you it doesn't hold that because it doesn't. You cut half the gym out, you're cutting half the population. How are you not cutting where the water goes? All right, so for the example of cutting half the gym, if you were to cut half the gym right here and say we did it, it works like our navigation structures. You cut half the gym, this side of the gym actually gets deeper, so you have more room, so then you can build a second story on the gym, so you can fit all the same amount of people in it, and you just have them shaped differently. Well, how's the gym going to get deeper? Well, it's, well the gym's not going to get deeper, but the river the does, because right? the river is a natural system. Why don't you just bridge all the river instead of putting in the wind gun? That's just that much more that the river can get deeper, and that many more barges can put on. Now, at the beginning, you were talking about how important barge traffic is. We know that. We are not arguing that barge traffic is not important. So I don't, I don't see why that was relevant. I mean, you know, you go everywhere else to get scientists and everything else to come here and tell you that you can put this in. But all these people are telling you that it's not going to work and we live here. Why, why do you think they know more than we do? Well, I'm mainly 
mainly because I'm not so But we went to experts that have, have experience in this and this exact problem so we can ensure that whatever we're doing in the river is not impacted. And we're willing to share information. We're here to discuss this with you so you understand where we're coming from, you understand the research that we're relying on to, to, uh, to come to our conclusions, and you understand the modeling that we've done. We've made the report available so, so you can read it, you can understand it, you can talk to other people that you know that may have a modeling background. So that's, and that's the best that we can do, is to help you at least understand where we're coming from and what information we're using to make our conclusions. And you were talking about, you know, it doesn't really make that much difference in the water height, except maybe when it's at the top a little bit, correct? No, I did not say it doesn't make that much difference except when it's at the top. You said earlier that when it's at the top, it may make a little difference, but not at all. And the so little you're talking bit. about the .05 <coughs> <coughs> impact directly around the structure. Right, you said when it gets to the top, it may make a little difference, but not that much. Yeah, it's the zero point. Okay, if you recall the New Year's flood, do you know how high the water got? We were very close. We all did. Yeah. It got right there at the top of that levee. So you're going to tell us that a little bit isn't that big a problem. That's we had sandbags holding the river back. A little bit's a problem. No, I understand. I came out here afterwards with the group of academics to evaluate the levee and some people from Carbondale, some people from the University of Illinois. So I was out on the levees. I got to see, I got to talk to people. And what we are saying, just to make sure that it's clear, is that when we, and this is the reason why we did a two-dimensional model, why we took the extra step, so we could show and help make sure people understood what is the impact of these structures, particularly on floods. And what we found is that in the areas that we're concerned about, along the levees, along the banks, along most all the channel with the exception of some local areas, there is no impact of having these structures in, at flood levels. Which means that when this construction is completed, that this will make absolutely no difference on where the water level is against your levee. But, you know, such as Matt said, you're wanting to move the water closer. Or deep in the water that's already close. What we're doing is we're we're putting a side channel here, which is still you know, almost half a mile from, from the levee. It doesn't matter how far it is, it's still right there next to the levee. The water's still going to go up, and it's closer to the levee this time. You know, we already get hit by the water that's far away from the levee. Why make it closer? I understand your concern, but we... At, at bank full and higher, this is it's negative essentially with the additional water that's being diverted at low flow. Okay. How much pressure can the levee hold? That's not a geotechnical The closer the water yet. is, the more pressure you're going to put on it. Our levees are in bad shape. You want to spend this money on research that <coughs> you guys did? Spend money on the levees. If it's going to raise the water heights, don't. I mean, you don't have to admit it, but pay to fix the levees. And I can guarantee you that this is not, that the construction of this prod is not going to put extra pressure on you. It is. The levee burst down there. The levee almost burst in Grand Tower. <laughs> what are you going to do with more pressure on the levees that are already weak? Like I just said, this... Maybe it won't overtop them, but what about busting them? This construction will not put additional pressure on you. All right, I'm so sorry, before you start, I just want to clarify something. Our authorization... Requires us. So it's basically law that requires us to maintain a 9 foot deep, 300 foot wide channel. And we have two ways to do that once again. You use river train structures, you use the river's energy to do this, and are to repetitively dredge these breaches. Uh, our authorization also requires us to minimize the amount of dredging to do that, uh, to maintain you know, the authorized channel. So it's basically, you know, our authorization is requiring us to address locations where we can, using engineering, to address repetitive lo you know, locations of dredging to maintain our channel connections. So I just wanted to clar clarify that. Thank you. So you say you guarantee this won't raise the flood heights, but yet you say you won't pay to have, you know, the National Academy of Science come in and do a study. Why not? If you're so sure that your experts are right, then why don't you let somebody else come in and try to prove you wrong? Yeah, we already addressed this, but in the reason why we've had the 
continue to research this continually for the last 80 plus years. There's a large body of, of literature out there that points to these, not, these types of structures not having an impact on flood levels. So, but if you're yeah. so sure, then why are you scared to let somebody else come in and do a study? We're absolutely not scared to have somebody else do a study. We're willing to participate in any kind of external review. We've worked hand in hand with the people that are critical of our project. If you want to fund that, more than that. That's why I'm asking. If you want to bring the National Academy of Sciences in here to review this, pay them to do it, we're, we're glad. Well, it's glad to show you that, that the documentation. Okay, we'll show you everything. There's nothing being hidden here. Okay, we're, we're going in a circle here. It looks like it's a class assignment that, that somebody assigned here. So, so, well, when you the same question, you get asked by a bunch of people. I that so, if it wants to be, if you guys want to see this information, pay for the National Academy of Sciences to come in here and look at the information. Corps of Engineers will gladly turn everything over to the National Academy so they can review it. Is that simple? Well, I mean, you can stand here and go back and forth. It's not going to change anything. You can keep asking why the National Academy is, why are you afraid to have them review it? It's not a question of being afraid. It's a question of money. And when you get older, you all understand this too about how much money it takes to, uh, to make the world go around. No, I'm not insulting you. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. He's a high school kid. Yeah, I get that. Okay? I am. I am. Okay, but we're going, we're going to certainty. certainty. If you have a question, ask us great. Ask a question. Okay? But when you get up here and keep asking the same thing over and over again, we understand what's going on. So, yeah, go ahead. I've got another question. Have you ever done a 2D study or a 2D model without any of the dikes? Have you ever tried that? See what the water heights would be then? The difficulty in that is we have no idea what the bed would look like. Well, why don't you try it and see what it looks like? You, you need to have an idea of what that is before you begin. Like, you, the model doesn't tell you what the bed's going to look like. You tell the model what the bed will look like. And, and if these structures weren't here, that levee may not be there because the river may have moved a half mile toward the Illinois bank. So do we, is that the assumption we should make then? You know, so... I mean, I don't understand what you're saying. I mean, so without the dikes in the river, the river would be different, right? The, 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 the natural processes of the river would it'd be meandering, right? Without the river train structure... You guys are already changing and, already. Can, can I just finish, please? So the natural processes of the river, particularly on the fluvial environments, is they meander. That's why you have oxbows. That's why you have, that's why it's a floodplain. It goes from bank to bank to bank, right? So the natural processes of the river do that. So the river training structures redirect the flow towards the center of the channel, as well as the revetments. That's what this program does. It, it, the ancillary benefit is it, it actually keeps the channel locked in place so the levees don't get impacted by the channel meandering on a, you know, on, a, on a natural basis. That's a fact. Let me take a step this answer just to see if I can clarify my understanding because I know that you had a good question and I want to give you an answer. So, is your question if we removed all of the dikes out of the system, if we were to model that and see what happens, or is your question why didn't we do a model that didn't have the structures in it that we're proposing? Yes, remove the dikes and see what it looks like. Yeah, and like Don said, there's hurdles with that, but there are some different types of studies that we can use to understand what is the impact on flood risk if we don't have structures. So as you know, we have this regulating works project has been ongoing for many years. I mean, I talked about evaluations dating back to 1933. This has been, we've been building structures in the river since the 1800s. So although we can't do a model because we don't have uh, a base condition to calibrate to, is essentially what Don was saying. We do have field data that we can look at, and through specific age analysis and other types of field data analysis, we can look at, you know, what has happened to the, to the certain discharges? What has happened to the flood discharge? What is the stage of that flood discharge? When we, in a time period 50 years ago, when we had less structures, or 50 years from that, when we had more or less structures, to now. So although we can't directly model it, we can evaluate field data to get an idea of what the impact is on on flood levels or stages for different floods. And that's something that we've done. That's something that we've had the USGS do. We've had academics from Colorado State University look at this. 
And what they found is that there's no additional, there's no change in flood risk from the construction of our structures over the last 100 years. So, yeah, we can't model it, but we have, through other analyses, evaluated that exact question that, that you raised. Sure. Uh, so, would you say that river transportation is doing pretty well right now? Like how, how's the business? Am I making a pretty good amount of money? I, that's not my call. I mean, we're, we have a congressionally mandated project. How much did you guys say you saved for river, river transportation, or how much is going through there? On an annual basis, we save transporters, not river industry. We save transporters, so people that transport full commodities. If you compare river engineering, are using you know navigation system to trucks and our rail, we save our transporters that transport bulk commodities, which are grains, fertilizers, petroleum product, on annual over three billion dollars a year. Relatively, they're doing well. So if they're doing so well, then why would you keep adding in? Because eventually there's got to be a point to where you either stop or you're at a happy medium. Things are fine, you know, we're making enough, blah blah blah. We don't have to have to know everything come in and make new dikes. Or there's a point where you go too far and you ruin thousands of people's lives. So, I mean, which which one are you guys looking for first? I don't I don't quite understand your question, but well, your question is when when you're when concerned you that we may build dikes. too many structures, we've gone too far at the detriment of the public for navigation. And how do we evaluate where that too far is? And the answer to that is monitor. We monitor projects that we work on. We, when we build structures out there, we do pre and post construction surveying and monitoring. We have done analyses of exactly what we just talked about, looking at gauge records, looking at, at changes in the, in the flow capacity of the channel. And so we are actively monitoring and continuing to evaluate everything that we construct out there and looking at long-term records to ensure that we don't get past the point that you're talking about, where we do, where we, we could incre increase our uh, yeah, change of flow rates. So, uh, would, let's see, there's 260 around about wind dikes in Jackson County. Is that a great number for a specific county, or is that, you know, normal? They don't have to do that county by county. Okay. Uh, well, compared to, say, Union County, 107 or 170, that sounds like a big scary number. So why are you guys going to conduct your research on these experimental dikes, which you just stated we never, the exact model is never tested before, in this already populated area that's already in so much of a risk of each other place? Why could you guys have picked it on a maybe less populated area with wing dikes and people, or maybe this is just a hot spot? To address your question, we were, we're going to do something. As Mike talked about in the beginning, we have a repetitive dredging issue where it costs us a substantial amount of money to dredge and keep the navigation channel open through that reach. So we're going to construct, we're going to construct something. We worked with our environmental partners, we did the environmental, uh, the EA, we had a public hearing to make sure that we took into account everybody's feedback on that. So the fact that these are, are slightly manipulated from what we've used in the past is a lot of the reason why we went back and we put this project on hold so we could further evaluate it using the most up-to-date tech technology out there, which is multi-dimensional hydrodynamic modeling. So we could, we could, one, verify that this isn't going to have an impact in flood stages, and two, so we can share that information with the public. Uh, so you guys said that wing dikes, they dredge out as much area as they take up, right? So it's basically no change in the river? Yeah. So what, um, you know, you have to explain to me on high school, what do, uh, like, what's the effects on chevrons and the hand spikes and all that stuff? Does that take the same effect, or is that just environmental while you're putting No, evaluations of cross-sections and monitoring pre- and post-construction surveys have shown that, that we see the same results. There's, so what, there's actually been some, there's been some 2D modeling of some chevrons up in St. Louis Harbor, where we we verified that they do not have an impact on on stages at discharges over bank full. So there, has, there are some cases we've done some modeling. We've put the structures in place. There's a situation we've put, put chevrons in place and other types of structures that are different than your traditional wing dikes. And we've had the opportunity to, to monitor a lot of the gauge data to evaluate what has happened for flood discharges or flood discharge as the stage getting higher or lower. 
and we're, we're confident through this monitoring and analysis that, that we're not having an impact on it. I guess just to add to that, once again, I, sp I spoke a little bit about this earlier. We're required to avoid and minimize the impacts of our structures. And our environmental partners are telling us by constructing them in this shape, in this orientation, that is going to avoid and minimize in the environmental impact of, say, using a traditional wing dike right off of the bank. That is the absolute reason why we're using these structures, because we're required. Uh, I just wanted to clarify another point. Um, our, our project and program is specifically for navigation. It is, it, it's not to benefit any uh, levy district, so to speak. So it's not similar, like down south, south of here in Memphis, uh, New Orleans, uh, Vicksburg, their, their, their projects are combined. It's the MRT system. So the river channel and the levees are all one program. Here, we have separate programs. So the levee districts are, are, are separate from the river navigation program. So our authorization is specifically, and our funding is specific to the navigation channel. Why are we having this conversation? What do you mean, why are we having this conversation? So, I
that, that, that was specifically designed that way, to create well, those knowledge for concepts. But, but my experience has been, eventually we'll have wheels and everything else going on, and it will wind up being a, a truck. A permanent island going. versus a federal yes. island. Yes. Yes. I didn't see the slide then. This is down south of here. So what we have here is a series of multiple ground point structures, basically plops, rock. These all act similarly for navigation. But once again, we had to avoid and minimize the impact of the environment by constructing these structures. So what you hear, have up here are wing dikes with notches in them to create this depositional area downstream. This W dike, which was designed to create plunge pools and depositional area here for habitat for, for fish as well as these multiple round point structures, which are clusters of rock to create eddies and different velocities through here and different, different bed uh, depths and distribution throughout that reach. Once again, to avoid and minimize the impact of just straight lines going across here. So yes, that was intentionally designed that way to create this deposition here, this plunge pool, as well as the deposition, plunge pool, as well as the deposition here, yes. So I guess, I don't know if that answered your question, but yeah, those are intentionally designed to actually create that habitat for, for the environment. Can't trace the Preston Living Range. First off, I want to commend you guys on presenting a very convincing presentation with the information you shared. With that being said, I'm going to get a little nostalgic. When I was eight years old, I built a 55 Chevy mop. When I was 18 years old, I had a buddy, Dad had it. We took it out on the town on Friday night. I didn't learn very much from that mop, but I did build a 55 Chevy. When you look around this crowd, there's a lot of people here that I would compare to a driven 55 Chevy. They're saying just make comments. You've seen what you've seen. You know, we're not pointing the blame at the rock dikes probably all of our high water problems. We have more concrete, we have more asphalt, we have tiled farmland. Uh, I would be not calling the kettle black because I'm a farmer. If I have a low area, if I can drain it, I drain it. That puts more water into the river. I think the concern that we have here is it might contribute one tenth. You know, the cumulative effect of all these rock dikes up and down this river. And we are part of the environment also. Uh, people here know places that used to be farmed that you don't farm anymore. Well, what's changed there? Is that the climate? Is that the rooftops, the asphalt? Or is that partially due to wing dikes and nest dikes and other things that the Corps of Engineers has developed? And unless I'm totally wrong, I think probably most people in this area, in this room, contribute to you all's paychecks. You know, pretty much. Uh, large traffic, large industry, my understanding on the Mississippi River is not really increasing, not really decreasing. It's kind of flat. Uh, most highly subsidized form of transportation in the, in the nation. Uh, in reality, green dot. Wing dike, S dike, bridge. There's people like these right here that are paying for that. And I think the whole reason of this community is that we're paying for that and it's detrimental to us. And if you put yourself in those shoes, I don't think anybody's happy. So I can't say that I point the blame at the rock dike, but I can't say that there's not some influence there, along with some other things. With that being said, at least listen to these people. They've all got concerns. And the concerns are economic to them. That's important. Just listen to them, please.
My name is Richard Cunningham. I'm the county board chair here. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. The big thing that I can see here is your main concern is river traffic. Our main concern is the lives and livelihood of the people who live and have been born and raised here. It looks to me like you should collaborate with the Corps on the levees and to see what the effect is going to be here. We know that over a number of years, from the river bank up to the levee, this is crazy. Uh, this flood that we just had in January, they lowered the flood crest right north of here. Our crest didn't go down at all. It came up to where it was supposed to be. And we're just a very short distance from over top of our levee. That's what we're concerned with, losing the life that we've had for generations. We want that to be taken into consideration. One thing I do want to clarify is I know we talked about, or Mike had talked about the benefits of navigation and the cost savings for navigation. But ultimately, independent of, of navigation, is we're going to maintain, we have a congressional mandate to maintain the channel either through dredging or structure construction. So you had brought up, you know, this is this is our money, this is our tax dollars that's paying for it, and that's exactly why we do what we do. And that's exactly why we want to build structures in this reach so we can reduce the expenditures in this reach so we can put in a, a certain amount of structure which will then reduce our annual dredging savings. So I know we talked about all the, all the navigation, but it's really a, an economy of dredging costs versus structure costs. And when we do the economics of that, the structure costs are, I think, the benefit ratio of the structures versus annual dredging are, is High, much higher than I don't know the numbers in front of you, but it's, it's when, a high benefit. When that cost. fills in behind your structure and it keeps getting higher, you're going to have to dredge that just like that W that you had on that picture. We don't dredge the W. When the pictures that you saw are of low water, so what will what'll happen behind here is you're going to see a, a sandbar probably develop. Right, that it, that that most average flows is, is submerged by. I understand that that's low water there. Mm -hmm. But that sandbar behind it is going to continually get bigger. This one? Yes. All of them. But what happens when the flow goes over these structures, it's going to take the top off of that sandbar. And where is it? But it just keeps going. So it's not, the sandbar is not going to be able to continue to grow and grow and grow and become a big vegetative. But that sandbar would be there regardless if we had those river training structures or not because we'd be artificially maintaining the channel with dredged oil, and this is exactly where we'd be placing the spoil. Do you, do you understand that? When we dredge the channel, we don't we don't take the material upland. We don't have a disposal area. We discharge it adjacent, typically adjacent to where our, our, our dredge location is. Right. So those bars would be there regardless. They may even be larger and may have more in, you know more developed than you know these current these current forms. So. And also going back to to the comment about you know listening understanding where you're coming from. I had the opportunity to work with, with Ms. Nash Bayberry. Her class was at, at our, I got a chance to spend a day with them. And I understand the concerns. I was at the public hearing, and this is exactly why we take this very seriously, and we continue to evaluate this. And this is why we agreed to and conducted the additional modeling. And not only conducted the initial mo additional modeling, but we went out to make sure that we were doing the appropriate model, and to ensure that we were doing it correctly and ensure that it got the proper review to ensure that the results are right. Because we do understand what your concerns are. And I've had a chance to see it firsthand and, and talk to many of you, including some classes from here and some students from the school. Yes? What happens if it doesn't work? If your computer models are wrong and it doesn't work, are you just going to leave them in there and just say, well, that was a screw up, we'll see what happens? Well, the computer model, it's not the only thing that we've done to evaluate this. We have a number, if you, if you read through the environmental assessment, if you read through a petting stack, there's a number of different studies, a lot of research that goes into this decision and the conclusion that these don't impact flood levels. So this model is really one new component evaluating this, and it looks at the additional, the manipulation of the structure uh, from a more traditional structure that we've used. So it's not like we went in with the model and said, okay, this is our one shot, if this is wrong, we're, there's nothing to, to base our conclusion on. There's 
years and years and years, decades of, of analysis. Two-dimensional maps have shown everything to be true. This is what's going to happen. Are you also saying that the wing bands that are in there right now are outdated, aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing? Should we go in and remove those? Or are they, you know, are they still doing their job? I would say that they're doing their job, but the system needs to be tweaked a little bit to, to ensure that we're not good in this area. We have about 10 minutes left. I just want to make sure before you go, anybody else want to ask a question? Basically said it won't fail. That's a that's like more of a project question. Yeah, yeah you're, you're, so, uh, so when you say when they don't work, you're saying they're actually inducing. I'm saying exactly what you said. Well, you can't predict what's going to make you a better decision. Sure. Because the computer says it's going to work, but doesn't necessarily mean it's going to make you not going to go very far. And then you go step back and say, Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly monitor, monitor this reach, absolutely, uh, to, to make sure that our river training structures are performing and not impacting, you know, the flood heights within this reach. It's certainly, it's certainly part of our post-construction evaluation. Yes. I guess the reason why I say that, it seems like there's more stuff going in than coming out, and we're putting in new stuff that has all this technology behind it, and the stuff that was put in 50, 60, 70 years ago, is it... If it's doing its job, yeah, there, if it's not, we're going to take it out. What we're doing right now is we're, we're, we're getting towards the completion of this project. So we're making our final tweaks, so to speak, at our highly dredged areas where we, we spend a lot of money on an annual basis. So, uh, and then one of these locations is right here. You know, that's, what, that's why we're here and that's why we're addressing it. So it's not like it's a system wide approach where we're putting in river train structures up and down the river on an annual basis. We typically have one project a year where we have maybe five to seven river train structures where we add to the system. And in this one, we're actually, I don't know if I did a good enough job to point this out, but we're actually removing two structures as well. So it's, these two structures downstream are going to be removed. They're no, they're no, they're no longer needed. So exactly what you're saying. We're evaluating the system as a whole and in areas where we can remove them, we're, we're, we're doing that, and they're not needed. So by placing these three structures in, we're degrading these two dikes. So exactly what you're saying. I just want to say a couple things as we're finishing up. Um, one, I think it's important to thank you for coming, because you did listen to us in the sense that you didn't put the S dikes in right away. And the hearing two years ago, we asked that you hold off. And we do appreciate the fact that these S dikes weren't in our land, weren't in our river when this record flood happened a couple months ago. So with that, we appreciate it. I don't think we're ever going to see eye to eye. I mean, we've had now about three meetings. You have your opinion. Clearly, we have ours. Ours is that a group like the National Academy of Sciences should look at the whole thing, not just the Grand Power Project. You tell us you don't want to use your funds to fund that. You actually told us to use our own funds. I don't, we don't have water funds. And what I'm hearing, I'm hearing that some of you actually may, you keep pointing out your job is to keep the river open, and it's almost like you're saying, you know, your boss is telling you to do it, and I'm getting the feeling some of you might even feel a little bit like we do a little bit. But I do want you to know I appreciate you being very cordial with us and with my students. Um, Mr. Broward, you've done great presentations in the past. Mr. Rogers, I appreciate your presentation. What are your names again? Rouse? Rouse. <laughs> okay, I appreciate you guys as well. Uh, sir, for boy's shirt, what, what's your name? I didn't catch it. Okay, I know you know my name because you quoted my Facebook about the long winded technical study. So you can see my Facebook, you know who I am. One thing I want to say to you, sir, is I don't appreciate, appreciate you insulting my students. Other people from the board have always been very respectful. Jamie McVickers, Michael Peterson, Mr. Brower. They recognize that it's a wonderful thing that I actually have my students involved in something where they're trying to save the communities. I didn't spend 
many of those questions. We have studied it a lot. But I didn't know to say, you go back to this, you go back to that. That was all that it takes a lot of nerve to stand up here with this microphone. So when you start calling them out about being a high school student, suggesting they might not know things, I took that part. So I appreciate the rest of you being very cordial and being respectful to my students. I don't see any more point in having these future meetings because I honestly kind of feel like guys, it's a waste of our time. We've said it, we've said it about three different meetings. I do appreciate you listening, kind of, but I mean, we see opposite ways, and unless someday you discover something new, these meetings are a waste of time, let's be honest. We have a difference of opinion, and I think it's going to say that way. So, thank you for coming.